I'm going to get into some bird friendly backyards and um, we're going to talk about why birds need our help and why we need to make our backyards bird friendly. And I'm going to go over some of the native plant stuff too, but I'm preaching to the choir here. You guys know a lot about that, so I won't go into too much detail because um, it's all stuff you guys know. But uh, as far as bird friendly backyards go, um, and because I am a uh, professor of ornithology, or I used to be, um, I always like to do quizzes. So if anyone wants to type in the chat what this bird is and what this plant is, uh, you get bonus points. So feel free to do that um, if you would like, if anyone knows. I see some of you quickly typing American goldfinch. Very good, very good. And you guys probably get to see them in purple cone flower, yep. Very good. So quick fun fact about the uh, American goldfinch. They are one of the, they are one of the very um, few birds that are actually uh, strict vegetarians. They really don't go after insects. So I'm gonna be talking a lot about insects during this talk, but the goldfinch is one of the few who don't really eat them. So kind of a fun little fact there. Um, so one of the reasons why I do a lot of what I do is because a Cornell study found that one in four birds are gone since 1970. So birds have declined um, for a lot of different reasons, uh, and a lot of it is native plants and the use of non-native plants and landscaping, as well as uh, window and building collisions and uh, outdoor cats and just a lot of different things have affected birds, um, unfortunately. So we need to do everything we can to help them. Um, Overall, we had a 2.9 billion birds gone since 1970. So one in four is about that number. Um, and it's uh, it's keeping or continuing to go down and uh, climate change has only increased um, the rate of uh, birds, you know, decreasing in population. So the survival by degrees uh, a uh, study that came out from Audubon, it's called Birds Tell Us. Uh, it talks about the five, 389 species on the brink. So it's about one third of the birds in North America are actually threatened due to climate change and just climate change, not other things. And then um, looking at this map here, if you're not familiar with uh, bird flyways, this is a, a migratory map and it shows South Carolina right here. And it shows different bird migration tracks based on different species groups. And you can see we're in a kind of a high traffic area. A lot of birds use our state for breeding, through migration and for winter. So year round, our yards are very important to birds. Um, there are about 914 species in uh, North America, give or take, depending on who you talk to. 389 of them are threatened due to climate change. And 140 of them are considered uh, SCDNR priority species. Oh, I'm sorry. 162 are DNR priority species, and then 140 are the number of climate threatened birds in our state. I got those numbers mixed around. Um, so either way, we have a lot of birds here and a lot of the birds are in trouble. So we're gonna talk about the threats that they face. Um, in 1940, you could see the housing density here in North America. It's not very dense. Uh, you know, there's a couple pockets where our major cities were, but um, a lot of our nation looks like this, big swaths of native trees and old growth forests and agricultural lands and things like that. But fast forward to today and um, from 1940 up to the projected housing density for 2030, there's a lot more people and there's a lot more dense red areas of urban and suburban habitat. And a lot of those places, unfortunately, look something like this. So, you know, to the um, lay person, you might say, oh, that looks kind of nice. Everything's symmetric, everything's set up in a neat little row. But for a bird, this is a desolate place with very little food. It's full of poisons and threats and all sorts of bad stuff. And one of those bad things is, oh, my computer doesn't want to work. Hopefully it doesn't jump a whole bunch of slides. There we go. Um, in window strikes. So one thing I want to talk to you guys about, because we are native gardeners and we're big on native plants, and I'm sure a lot of you have them around your home, which is attracting and feeding birds, which is awesome. But if you have birds hitting your windows, you're not really helping the birds in general. You're kind of creating a bit of a death trap. <laughs> so, um, you know, thinking about if you have window collision issues in certain areas, 
um, on your home to, you know, mitigate those. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, this imprint here, you can see on the window, it's interesting. Birds have a very specific type of feather called powder down. It's a feather that kind of breaks off into tiny little um, particles and it helps to waterproof and it helps to preen their feathers. And so when they smack it to a window, that powder down leaves an imprint. So that's why it looks like that. It's not oils or anything like that. It's that very specific feather meant for preening. Um, I kind of got off track there, but uh, up to a billion birds die a year from window strikes. Um, I can't see all of you right now, but usually if I'm doing this talk in person, I say, how many of you have ever had a bird hit your window? And pretty much everybody raises their hand. And then I say, okay. how many of you had more than once? And then even more people raise their hand. So it happens to everybody. So if you think about that, everybody's had it happen. How many people do we have in the United States? How many windows do we have? And then a lot of times we're not around when it happens either. Um, predators have become really good at hearing that thump when the birds hit the glass and then they come by and pick up the body. So if you have a problem window that you've noticed it happened once or twice, it's probably happened a lot more because other predators like raccoons, foxes, cats, what have you, are picking up the bird that's died from hitting the window. So big problem. Car collisions are another big one. Uh, 340 million birds die a year from getting hit by cars. And there is something you could do pretty easily to um, you know, stop this. Uh, a lot of people think um, throwing something like apple cores or banana peels out your window isn't a big deal because it's biodegradable if you're on a car trip because no one wants a smelly banana peel in the car if you've got another two hours until you stop. But by doing that, you're attracting rodents to the side of the road and, you know, what hunts rodents, but hawks and owls and eagles and things like that. Or maybe you're attracting a squirrel or a possum who then gets hit by a car and then what's eating that dead squirrel or a possum? A black vulture or a turkey vulture or uh, bald eagles are big time scavengers and they often get hit by cars. So um, hanging onto your food until you get to a rest stop and throwing it away is the best thing to do. Um, this is a black vulture. Uh, unfortunately, this is a squirrel from my yard. Um, so I think it was just unlucky timing with this one. It wasn't really trash related, um, but the vulture came to pick it up for us. So that was nice. Um, cats. Uh, God bless them. I love cats. I have a cat. There's a cat sleeping here who also might make an uh, unscheduled interruption during this talk, but cats kill. The most recent number I heard was 3 billion birds a year. So that's a lot. So if you have a cat, um, if you can keep it indoors, that's the ideal thing. My cat, um, well, we'll talk about him in just a minute because I've got a picture of him later, but he's leash trained and I have a catio and all sorts of stuff. Um, leaf blowers, something you wouldn't really think about being an issue for birds. Leaf blowers are so kind of violent when they're, you know, blowing leaves and um, causing disturbances. They'll actually cause birds to abandon their nests in the springtime. So if you have like a row of azaleas or shrubs that you know birds are nesting in, do your best to avoid that area if you're using a leaf blower. Now, this is uh, some of the preaching to the choir stuff. This is kind of shocking for people who love the green lawn and golf course looking habitat or golf course looking yards. Um, you know, we look at this and some people say, oh, that's lovely. But we know that it requires weekly mowing and emissions and time. Uh, there's monoculture, there's no diversity there. You have to put on fertilizers, you have to water it, um, fungicides, insecticides, weed killer, there's all sorts of maintenance and resources being dumped into this lawn. And for what? It doesn't really, doesn't really do anything. And lawns are also, um, so they're biological deserts and they're the most irrigated crop in the United States, which is crazy to think about. Um, you know, water is somewhat of a finite and precious resource in some places. And the fact that we're just watering grass for the, you know, more than any other food source is insane. Um, and lawns cover an area in the United States three times the size of New Jersey. New Jersey isn't that big, but still, that's a lot of space of, you know, useless resource sucking grass. Um, and they also can contribute to flooding issues because their roots are shallow and they're so compact. It almost acts like an impervious surface, um, not quite like asphalt or anything like that. But if you have a heavy rain and you have a grassy area, you'll see, you know, the water just kind of running straight off of it. Um, and lawns, you know, at one point in time uh, served a purpose. Uh, back in the feudal system, you would have a castle or a central village and you had a grassy area all around it. So you could see the marauders coming to, you know, kill you and steal your kids or something like that. So at that point it was, it made sense, uh, but they also used it for grazing and things like that. But um, as time went on, 
different sports uh, became popular and became a symbol of high society. And uh, so lawns were actually uh, considered a showing of wealth. Because if you had land that you didn't have to use for food production and you had someone um, that you either owned or paid to cut that lawn to keep it flat, it was just a huge show of money. It's like, you know, parking a Ferrari in your front yard, I guess. Um, so it was very desirable. Everybody wanted a lawn. And up until the invention of the lawnmower, people couldn't, not everyone could afford a lawn. But then the lawnmower happened and it made the lawn possible for the average Joe. So this is a picture of the first lawnmower, which actually doesn't look that different from some of the ones that uh, you know they ride around on on the highway medians, um, except I think it was like coal and steam powered or something. But we went from this sort of lawnmower, very old clunky technology, to yard Roombas. So it's come quite uh, quite far. But long story short, grass is great in some places, but for the most part, we don't need huge expanses of lawns. They don't serve a lot of purpose and they um, use a lot of resources. So that being said, how can you help? Uh, Bob, this is from Solomon's Island when we caught one of the uh, Cooper's hawks. Um, oh, very nice. Thank you. Okay, go shut the door. Um, someone just finished a picture she was coloring. Um, so this is from Solomon's Island where Bob and I did some banning together. That's a Cooper's hawk. <laughs> So one of the first things you can do, um, you know, restore habitat with native plants, which I bet a lot of you are doing, which is awesome. Um, so I'll kind of go into why native plants are better for birds. Um, you probably all know the answer to this question. Um, but birds eat a lot of insects. 96% of land birds feed insects to their chicks. So, so if any of you have bird feeders out there, think, oh, my cardinals, they, you know, black oil sunflower and my tip my eat peanuts and things like that. Well, they have to feed their chicks protein. And so they feed them caterpillars. Um, so if you have chickadees in your yard come to your feeders, one nest of chickadees eats 390 to 570 caterpillars per day, or in the time it takes to fledge about two weeks, over 9,000 caterpillars just from one nest of chickadees. The chickadees are tiny. They're itty bitty little things. Um, and chickadees can have up to, I've seen a record, I think it was like 10 eggs in one nest or something. And chickadees often will have multiple broods in a year. So that just goes to show you how many insects, just one little family of chickadees needs, um, you know, let alone all the other birds that are in your neighborhood and in your yard. Uh, so as you know, uh, specialization is key. 90% of the insects that eat plants can uh, eat only the native plants for which they co-evolve. So, you know, it's a whole host plant system, which I, I know you guys know a lot about. But when we're talking about like the biggest bang for your buck when you're planting native plants in your yard to help feed the birds and have a big um, insect load, oaks are really the, the key species. Oaks are awesome. They support up to 530, yeah, they support up to 537 species of caterpillars, a ton, um, compared to the ginkgo tree here, which is a very pretty tree, it has great fall color, um, very decorative, but only four species of caterpillars. So if you, uh, I know outside of the Charleston Museum, there's this huge Ooh. row of nothing but ginkgo trees. <clears throat> sure is pretty in the fall, but um, pretty useless too. Uh, they don't really provide much for anything. So we also need to think about appreciating former pests. So I bet a lot of you know what this is. Uh, if you know it, can you type it in the chat? Let's see if anyone. Well, Mary. Yeah, I heard someone say it. Golf fritillary. Oh, yeah, very good. And then what is its um, host plant it's eating? Anyone know? That's Flora. Passion, passion flora. Yep. Yeah. Very good. I heard a couple. Very good. So Passiflora, um, Napop, or Passion Vine. Um, this is from my front yard. I planted some. Um, <laughs> this has gone kind of nuts, uh, but I'm glad. It, it pops up kind of everywhere in my front yard now. And then um, a couple weeks ago, when the Gulf fritillaries were really moving through, it was like constantly at least 12 butterflies in my yard at all times it looked like a little fairy party or something it was so fun and I've got chrysalises hanging off my house and my bird bath and um and the kids are raising them inside to you know learn about the whole process so very cool great bug uh, I don't think birds eat this type of caterpillar because if you look at it, it looks like it uh 
probably hurt going down. Um, so in the fuzzier caterpillars, like tent caterpillars, one of the few birds that can actually eat it is the yellow-billed cuckoo. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have seen a cuckoo around. They make really interesting noises. So when they show up in the spring, they have this like ooh, ooh, kind of noise. Um, and they, I don't know, they sound very exotic. But they are one of the few that can actually eat uh, the hairy caterpillars because they ingest it. And then they'll actually regurgitate the lining of their stomach with all the hairs and stuff wrapped around it. And they'll kind of like spit it out. So um, they're especially adapted to handle those. So if you have a big outbreak of tent caterpillars in your pecan trees, um, the cuckoos are gonna come and enjoy those. Um, so it's interesting to see how that kind of fluctuates year to year. You get a bunch of cuckoos, you get a bunch of tent caterpillars, and then one year you don't. Um, but anyways, learning to appreciate former pests, which I know you guys, uh, you know, you plant native plants to help all the animals and the bugs. So this is not a problem for you because those former pests are turning into beautiful things like butterflies and the price of their bunching is very much worth it. Um, and so, you know, planting host plants in your yard is a really big deal. And some of the, uh, the more common, you know, host species that we think of is milkweed and the passion vine and um, pawpaw and things like that. But think about the big generalist species too, the oaks, willows, and uh, the prunus um, genus. Those are all really good caterpillar providers. Um, and then I also tell people, uh, you know, think about the former pests as free bird food. So if any of you feed um, bluebirds, uh, if you feed them mealworms, mealworms can get pretty pricey. And I know, I think it's like, they can plow through a thing of, you know, 1000 mealworms pretty quickly, you know, in a week or something like that. But when you know that just a nest of chickadees goes through 9,000 caterpillars, just think about monetarily how much that free food is actually worth out in your yard, knowing how much you spend on cat or uh, mealworm larvae for, uh, for the birds. So it's, it makes sense, financial sense. So there's other things um, aside from just planting the right plants, uh, there's different garden structures and elements that you wanna consider when you're planting for birds. Um, birds mostly need in a habitat, food, shelter, and safe passage. So food is gonna mean a lot of different things depending on what species you're talking about. Shelter can come in a different, few different forms because birds use shelter in different ways in different times of the year. And then safe passage, you know, do they have, if you're feeding them, with a feeding system, do they have a place to scoot to, like a um, evergreen shrub or a brush pile if a cooper's hawk comes through? There's all these little things you got to think about um, when you're kind of feeding the birds and attracting them to make sure it's safe. Um, now, this one is uh, a, both pretty common species. I bet you guys probably know them. What's the bird? Anyone? Let's see. Oh, good question about the bald cypress. I don't think so, actually. I don't think they're very good hosts. Oh, bald cy cypress sphinx. Ruby thirded hummingbird. Yeah. So this is a ruby thirded hummingbird. And then what it's on, which I bet a bunch of you know, is a butterfly weed. So it's a milkweed variety. Um, and I'm sure that butterfly or that uh, hummingbird was drinking the nectar from there. But when you're planting for birds, you want to think about um, planting for all four seasons. So first thing in the spring, you want um, those caterpillar sources for the birds when they're raising their chicks, which is going to be happening very quickly in the spring, and also early nectar sources. Um, some of the really early nectar sources are red bud, which is what that bluebird is sitting on in the upper right corner. Um, holly trees, American holly, they have very early blooms, and so all the native bees go nuts for them. Um, so think about the first bloomers. And then once we get into, so spring, summer, um, we're gonna go to the bottom left here with the hummingbird. And I'm sure you guys know the cardinal flower. Um, so when you have plants in your yard, you wanna think about the blooms all four seasons, which you guys know for nectar birds anyways. So do you have something blooming in the spring, fall um, and summer? Uh, but then also, you know, are they providing caterpillars the entire time? And then once you get into later in the year, into fall, you get a lot of migratory birds coming through. So as you can see, this little um, beauty berry in the bottom hand, uh, bottom right hand corner is full of great berries. And migratory birds kind of time their migration with a lot of these berries that come out. 
Um, so beauty berries aren't the only bright purple berries that they like. Um, anyone who's been bird banding in the fall knows that pokeweed is also a very popular berry because the birds, um, they eat them a whole lot. And then when you put them in a little bird bag, once you capture the bird and you bring it back to get processed, they poop purple all over the place. And the cat birds like to poop on you and you end up covered in like purple stains and sometimes it doesn't come out. So um, those purple berries and also like the, uh, the cherries and um, some of the vining species, they all have berries that time of year, all the scrubby habitat. That's great fuel for migratory birds. Another really good one uh, tree wise for the fall and uh, bird migration is the Southern Magnolia. Okay, um, she finished her homework. Um, the Southern Magnolia is a really good one. Their little fruits from the cone are very popular with brown thrashers, mockingbirds, um, uh, woodpeckers, um, let's see what else, catbirds. Uh, so a lot of the bigger birds, especially thrushes, um, they love the magnolia cones. And if you have some, uh, it's a great spot to just sit and watch on a good fall day. You'll get vireos in it. So birds just go for uh, the magnolias and also the dogwood. So the eastern dogwood or flowering dogwood, those berries in particular or fruits are full of uh, fat and protein. So they're really, really good energy for when they're needing to make a big flight. And usually the birds will fly overnight. So if you're familiar with bird migration, um, most songbirds will migrate. You know, as soon as the sun goes down, they start getting up. And you can actually look at the weather radar during the fall, and you'll see all these circles around weather radars that aren't rain. And that's all the birds lifting up into the air to fly through the night. Um, and they do that mainly so they can navigate by the stars and using um, the um magnetic poles but they also do it to avoid raptors because raptors will migrate during the day they use those thermal lifts um to efficiently fly south for the winter um and so if they're out during the day all the songbirds don't want to be way up in the air just getting picked off by all the raptors so um i forget where i was going with all that <laughs> anyways they they fuel up for migration using things like magnolias and dogwoods and um, all those good purple berries in the shrubby habitat. So if you have pokeweed in the yard, leave it be. Um, it's a big bird food. And then come winter time, the wintering berries is a uh, you know a good thing to consider. Like yopon holly is a great one. Uh, the cedar waxwings love the yopon holly as well as American holly. Um, and then we also have I'm not sure what the robin is sitting on. That might be winterberry. Um, one of you might know better than me. But anyways, the robins really enjoy the berries. Um, I think of another winter berry species. Oh, uh, wax myrtle. So if you have wax myrtle, cedar, or not cedar wax wings, um, the yellow rumped warblers, we also call them butter butts. They're little gray birds, but they've got a bright yellow patch right above their tail. They come down here almost solely for um, those wax myrtle berries. That's mainly what they eat. And again, when you catch them in the fall or the winter time, um, <laughs> your bag will end up being full of mostly digested uh, wax myrtle berries in the bottom. Um, and also tree swallows, big, big flocks of tree swallows will come down and swarm wax myrtle bushes to eat the berries. And tree swallows, you think of them as aerial insectivores, but they also love the berries. So anyways, planting for all four seasons, think about what the birds need year round and uh, increase variety. So looking at not only just species type, but structure, birds will actually get together in what's called a mixed foraging flock. So they'll get together in a bunch of different species and they'll all kind of move through a habitat together. And the advantage of that is safety by numbers, you know, because Cooper's hawks and sharp chins are hanging around ready to pick off birds um, as they go. But if you're in a group, you're safer. And if you're in a group of mixed species, you're not competing with each other. So you'll have nut hatches coming along, you know, eating seeds out of pine cones, and then you'll have vireos kind of eating seeds off the ends of the trees, and then you'll have thrushes on the ground turning over leaves. Um, cardinals in the mid-story, grabbing berries. So think about your diversity of habitat structure. So the tall canopy trees, an understory, a shrubby layer, um, a low ground layer, you know, kind of just think about how much structure you have. The more structure you have, the more diversity you have. Um, it also gives you different opportunities to introduce different species in your yard too. All right, next slide. Oh. 
it is unresponsive. Let's go here. Um, water. So a lot of people um, like to offer bird baths and not all bird baths are created equally. Um, and a lot of people think, oh, they just need water in the summertime when it's really hot. But birds actually get a lot of their drinking water, especially they're young, they get it from their food. It's called metabolic water. So they digest their food and uh, magic of biology, it makes water. And they are able to sustain themselves off that. Because if you think about chicks in the nest, the parents aren't bringing little you know, water bottles to them. They were actually able to get it from their food. But during the winter time, when temperatures are freezing, that's when some of the birds will go crazy if you have a heated bird bath. That, that is a resource that they don't have access to if the water is frozen. So if you feel like giving them um, a little birdie spa, they sell bird bath heaters or just heated bird baths, and uh, you'll be very popular with the birds, especially the cedar wax wings. Um, and other elements of a bird bath that you want to think about, um, it doesn't matter too much if it's raised up on a pedestal or if it's on the ground. If you think about it, they're naturally, you know, taking baths in puddles. And so having a bird bath on the ground, totally fine. Um, you want to think about how uh, prone to predation they are. So if it's out in the open or there's shrubs nearby where a cat could hide out while they're taking a bath and then come out and get them, just think about those um, possibilities. And then with the depth of a bird bath, they really don't like water very deep at all. I would say maybe an inch. So some of those nice deep bowl bird baths, they're not going to be very good because unless a bird can sit on the edge and just drink out of it, um, it's not real useful for them. They need only about that much water so they can get in there and bathe. And sometimes they get worried if it's a dark color, they can't tell how deep it is. So you can put some like river rocks in the bottom. And then they love and they're drawn to the sound of running water. Um, so they sell some bird uh, fountains or bath fountains that like kind of shoot up in the air. That might be a little bit much, but you know, the birds will probably still come to it. But a little bubbling one like this, I just took a screenshot of a YouTube video earlier today, but a little bubbling one like this to create that water sound and then also to keep mosquitoes from breeding in there is perfect for birds. Um, and leaving dead snags, I'm sure you guys are very familiar with this, but dead snags provide a lot of different um, resources and things for different species. Uh, this one is kind of a funny long story of um, my neighborhood. So this was my neighbor's backyard. Uh, she lives two doors down and she had, I believe it was an old, I don't, know if that's a, I don't think that's a pecan tree. I can't remember what kind of tree it was, but it died and they cut most of it down, but they left the main um, trunks because she thought the birds would like it. And this is before she knew me. Um, and I said, you are absolutely correct because uh, the dead snags provide many, many services for birds. And then she got real lucky where this little screech owl moved in and raised the family for a couple of years in a row. And then a couple of years ago, I think it was two or three by now, the cavity had rotted out. So that's what happens with snags. They rot, it's what they're supposed to do. So the bird couldn't nest in there anywhere. So I immediately went to Birds Unlimited and got myself a screech owl box and tried to steal her owl. Well, the first year it ended up nesting in a neighbor's like old torn down shed. Um, but the following year, last year, it nested in our box and it was like the best thing ever. Cause we were, you know, it was COVID and quarantine and we just obsessed over our owl family. Um, so very, very fun. But uh, leaving dead snags is very important for a lot of bird species um, like screech owls, but also it became a really big issue for eastern bluebirds. So a lot of people love bluebirds. Um, they're very recognizable. And if you're a bird lover, like bluebirds have got to be up there on your list. But they actually declined greatly in numbers because people kept taking down natural cavities and dead snags. Some birds are what you call secondary cavity nesters, which means they rely on either natural cavities to just happen like a, a branch fall, or they rely on a woodpecker or something else to excavate a cavity and then leave it. And then they go and move into it and use it. So they are secondary cavity nesters, meaning they just will take what's available. They cannot make their own. Um, and so any bird that is like that, like chickadees or titmice or screech owls or barred owls, um, they rely on these dead snags to naturally occur. But we didn't think they looked nice. Um, and so a lot of people tore them all down. And so the bluebird population plummeted and they were not common at all until people started to put up houses for them. And now we're trying to spread the word that if you have a dead snag on your property and it's not going to fall in your house, you should leave it because a lot of birds really benefit from it. So not only for the cavities, but it provides a place for them to hide. It's a great source of insects because as that dead snag dies and breaks down, there's lots of insects in there to 
um, you know, feed a lot of different species of birds, kind of like a big giant bird feeder in your yard if you have a dead snag. Um, so it just is a great, great ecological value for not just birds, but a lot of different species. Now brush piles, that is my favorite uh, lazy gardening thing to do, aside from the leaves. Um, when you have a brush pile, it creates a really good safe place for birds to hide. And also you probably know it creates good habitat for um, different insects and like burrowing rabbits and uh, pretty much anything. It, it's a great spot um, for many different species, but I have seen, uh, I have a brush pile in the back of my yard and instead of bagging up a lot of my yard debris or trying to burn all the sticks and stuff like that, I just shove it all in a pile back where the neighbors can't see it and it won't bother anybody. And I've seen a number of times um, thrashers and sparrows, especially during the winter time, they dive into it to escape hawks and they, the hawks will sit on the outside trying to get in, but they can't get to them. So it's a really good shelter for birds. And then it's also a good um, source of food as that you know material breaks down, it creates insects and habitat for them. So it's just a really good uh, all around thing to do. And you can get real fancy with them. This is from, um, I think his name is Cress. I forget which book this is from, but this is a great way to make a really nice brush pile. I get kind of lazy. I just take a you know wheelbarrow full of stuff, just shove it all in the corner and call it a day. But you can, um, be real elaborate and make really good structures and uh, give some of the bigger animals places to run and to hide in the bottom of it. And this is um, an example of an easement we have. Um, it's an easement right up next to a residential area. And they unfortunately had to take down some pines they were getting really close to the house. Um, and so the woman who lived there said, oh, I want to, you know, do something for the wildlife. I feel terrible about taking these trees down. And so she used that method um, and made a brush pile. And she said, literally the next day, there were like chickadees and wrens poking around in there and getting food and bugs. So they're, uh, they speak for themselves. Now, in addition to structures in your yard um, for you know gardening for birds. There's a couple of best management practices, which again, I think for a lot of you, this is gonna be preaching to the choir, but there are some other things in there that I think um, are kind of a big deal, especially with um, folks who plant native plants, because um, when we plant native plants, we bring the birds in, which is awesome. But if we don't have safe windows or if we have outdoor cats, it's um, it's kind of a death trap for them. So we want to make sure we're doing the right thing and not, you know, having good intentions, but it going all wrong. Uh, so right here, I have uh, this is my front window of my house. These are bird friendly dots from Feather Friendly. Um, this big picture window is great because I could sit right on my couch and watch the bird feeders. But especially in the winter time, when I get big flocks of blackbirds, if a predator buzzes a yard, they all burst up into flight to try and get away and all had multiple hit the glass window. And so the first time that happened, I was like, oh my gosh, this could never happen again. And so I put, installed these feather friendly dots and it stopped it immediately. So there's a lot of different options for uh, window treatments um, that you know look different. You can do temporary ones if you see it's just a seasonal thing. Exterior screens are really one of the easiest and best ways to um, keep birds from hitting your windows. So if you have screens on your windows, you're good. But if you have a big picture window like this or sliding glass doors, that's another big one that kills birds. There are a number of different options, DIY or ready-made off the internet that you can do. Um, you can see I've got my Miss Flower here. So I've got the, the bird-friendly trifecta, bird-safe glass, the Miss Flower, and then my cat, uh, Clark Griswold, that's him there. Um, he is inside and he is wearing his harness because when he goes outside, he's on a leash, which is, that's him. Him walking with me, although he is probably like 15 pounds heavier from that picture. He's a big boy. Um, so it can be done if you want to get a cat, if you don't already have one. Once they're adults, they really don't like having harnesses put on and it's a whole thing. But I started him very, very young with a harness and he does great. So he, he's my little traveling companion. So another thing that you probably know to do, um, you know, being native plant folks is leaving the leaves. Um, this is, uh, so this picture, it was the only one I could find of a really good leaf picture in our, um, photo library from Audubon, but this is called a varied thrush. They rarely ever show up here. I think one showed up here maybe last year or the year before. It was very exciting. Um, I didn't get to see it, but thrushes in general, thrashers, 
robins, if you have leaf litter on the ground and you have a flock of them moving through, just watch them. They just pick up and they turn over leaves. They flick leaves over. They're looking for all those little insects, the chrysalises, the eggs, you know, whatever is under there. Um, they love to turn leaves over and that's how they forage. So leaving the leaves on the ground, if you can, is ideal because it creates really good foraging habitat for the birds. But as you know, if you actually get rid of the leaves, if you have to bag them up, you have an HOA that's gonna, you know, get on your case. You know, when you bag them up, you kind of end up throwing away a lot of things that you want around, like the luna moth cocoons and all the different, all the eggs that are laid on those leaves that fall in the in the fall, and then in the spring, all those caterpillars come out, and that's what the birds need. So you're throwing away all of their food sources um, for the springtime when the birds need it the most when they're raising chicks. Um, so if you can, you know, save as many leaves as you can and either rake them underneath of a bush or put them in your brush pile just so they're still there, that will at least um, preserve the eggs for all that spring food for the birds. Um, but I know HOAs are rough. Luckily, we don't have one, so I leave mine on the ground, but I'm sure my neighbors love it. <laughs> But either way, uh, something to consider. So not only just keeping them, but if you can keep them on the ground so the birds can use them for foraging, that is ideal. Now this one really bothers when I talk to garden clubs, they all go, oh, when I show them this one. Um, if you don't deadhead flowers, uh, the birds want those seeds. That's what they're going near for in the winter time. So the echinacea cones, just leave them up there. And if you really have to take them off, you can cut them and then just like Put them on the ground underneath so you don't have to look at them so they're not sticking up into the air um, but the birds are using those uh seed cones um for food in the winter time especially like the goldfinches um and then also <clears throat> which i've learned more recently and you guys probably know too a lot of the pollinators um i've heard this vaguely labeled as pollinators i'm sure there's a much more specific group of insects that do this but they'll overwinter into this the hollow dead stems so they'll go in there and kind of sleep in there and if you get rid of those i mean there goes your spring pollinators again. So not tearing apart your garden and cleaning it all out is um, the best thing to do. If you can just turn down your tidy meter and you know just let it go, that's the best thing to do. Maybe not in your front yard if other people have problems with it, but in your backyard, just let it go wild. Um, and also thinking about where you're getting your plants from. Again, this is Native Plant Society. You guys know where to get your plants from. Uh, local growers, people that you know and trust that are not going to be bathing your plants in neonicotinoids. Um, neonicotinoids are thought to be one of the causes of the colony collapse disorder, um, which is affecting honeybees, which we, I mean, honeybees are awesome, but we also really care about the native bees. They're also declining. It's affecting them too. Um, but then also things like monarchs and other pollinators, they think the neonicotinoids is causing issues with them as well. And a lot of nurseries are phasing them out, um, <clears throat> except for Ace Hardware, and that may have changed. That was a few years ago when I heard that. So uh, a lot of big box stores are now starting to put like be safe on the tags if you have to go to Lowe's and you're picking up something. So just check labels if you can to see if it says be friendly or be safe, because uh, then it shouldn't be using the neonicotinoids. Because apparently even if you get seeds that are coated in it, like some of the coated, I've seen it in like echinacea seeds and um, I forget what brand does it, but they'll coat it in this and it gets into the pollen and that's when the pollinators go they get the pollen and they eat it and then it affects, I think it's a nervous system issue. Um, so anyways, try to avoid pesticides if you can, because it also affects birds pretty terribly. And there's some recent studies about it. And I need to add it to this, um, this uh, presentation because um, a paper was recently published talking about how much uh, neonicotinoids um, in some of the insect populations were affecting populations up. I think it was blackbirds or something. Sorry, that's very big. I'll have to look that up and add it in there. So, you know, there's seven simple things you can do to help save birds in your yard, reducing um, pesticides, using your native plants, cats indoors. Yes. Uh, how bad? Okay. I think she's okay. Just get a paper towel. Okay. So we're good when she comes in and says, Cora's is bleeding. <laughs> Anyways, I don't hear screaming. It's probably fine. Um, so keeping your cats indoors, making your windows safer. So these are the two that we're kind of concentrating on, um, or three, I would say. Uh, and also invasive species. You guys know this as well as I do. Invasive species, they're not good for many different reasons. They sh shadow out or shade out the native ones. 
crowd them out um, and you get situations like that one before. Um, heavenly bamboo is a very popular non-native species, but um, you know, it might be used in your front yard. It has really pretty red berries that the birds do like to eat, but there is a cy uh, alkaloid cyanide, I think, um, hydrogen alkaloid, I don't know, something like that. But either way, the berries when eat, eaten in mass quantities, um, like cedar wax wings do, they'll come down to a shrub and just eat as much as they can because they're trying to you know, get away from their foraging habitat quickly so they don't get picked off by a hawk. So they gorge, 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 and then they eat all these berries and then they die of cyanide poisoning. Um, so if you have heavenly bamboo in your yard, if you can't get rid of it, just snip off the berries so the birds don't eat it. And it's also toxic to dogs and kids and all the other things we like. So um, if you can get rid of heavenly bamboo, that's a good one. And obviously choosing native alternatives to uh, the non-natives. There's a native wisteria, as you know. Trumpet creeper is fantastic for hummingbirds. They love it. Those tubular red and orange flowers, um, it fits their bill, um, fits the bill. Uh, so it's, they're adapted to feed out of it, you know? Um, and then obviously Chinese privet, terrible in so many ways. Um, and there's multiple kinds of it. Uh, but Yopon holly is a great alternative, um, and I'm sure you guys also know that you can make tea out of it, and that's what the Native Americans used to use as coffee. It's, it has caffeine in it. Um, so I wouldn't recommend eating the berries, as we all know. It's Ilex vomitoria. That sounds like fun for no one, except for the birds. It doesn't bother them. Um, and so, you know, now, if you're, you guys, again, know all this, but when it's time to find the right native plants for you and your yard, um, we, there's a couple resources you can go to, which I bet a lot of you already know about, but we have a very specific bird related one. So if you really want to, if you don't know a whole lot about birds, but you want to get more in your yard, say you really like Orioles, or I really like Cardinals, or, you know, um, the Goldfinches are my favorite, you can go to a database that Audubon has made, it's called audubon.org slash native plants. It's a native plant database. You put in your email and your zip code and it will bring up um, all the results or you know best matches of native plants in your area that are recognized for bird um, benefits. And then you can also search. So if you look up here, you know, you're looking for types of plants, say I really want a tree in the yard and I really want it to attract um, say blue jays or something. So you can say it, what type of plant and attract what type of bird. You can pick the bird group. Um, say, oh, we don't have any woodpeckers around. I'd love more of them. You know, you can just kind of use that, um, that search method so you can see how to attract some of your favorite birds that you want to see more of. And then um, that's a native plant database. And then you guys, you know, this is all the Audubon version of plants for birds, but you guys have a lot more detailed and uh, good resources for um, native plants. And I, I bet a lot of you probably already know about this one, but the Clemson Extension, um, Carolina Birds, or I'm sorry, Carolina Yards database, the plant database. I use that all the time when I'm doing native plantings because it's all about the right plant in the right place. Um, if you haven't used it before, it's awesome because you can pick, like, I want to pick a native plant. I live on the coast. It's in full sun. It has poor drainage. It has sandy soil versus clay soil. You can pick out all these different factors, and then it'll give you a list of native plants that would do well in those conditions. So it's taken a lot of the guesswork out of my yard, you know, because I think, like, oh, I would love a whole bunch of dahoon holly. And then, you know, it turns out it's not the right spot for it at all, and they've just killed a bunch of dahoon holly. Um, so using that has really helped me fine tune. And then I'll go to the Plants for Birds database and say like, I know I've seen Orioles around, I'd like them in the yard more. So, you know, I look up those plants and then I look up, I cross-reference that with the Carolina Plants or Carolina Yards database. And it just gives you like the best full picture of what plants you need to plant in your yard. Um, so I think in your guys' area, uh, Mill Creek Greenhouse and Wingard's Market are two good ones. It, are there any others? I might not know about other ones. Do you have any other good ones up there? Uh, Sal's Old Tiny Feed and Seed it just started selling native plants. Oh, nice. Okay. Good to know. Good. Well, yeah, those, um, I know the folks from Mill Creek and Wingers, um, and they're great. So it's good to hear that more people are picking up on it, especially the more smaller local stores that people probably been going to for years. You know, it helps introduce native plants to people who probably wouldn't be aware of them before. Um, 
And if you're in the Charleston area, we have a number of different good ones. Um, Roots and Shoots in West Ashley, up in uh, McClellanville, there's, um, I think it's Bottle Tree Nursery and uh, down on Spring Island, they grow their own. So, you know, now, thankfully, because this whole movement has picked up more and, you know, good folks like you have been preaching the native plant word, um, you know, for a number of years, it's become a lot more popular of a thing to do. So thank you guys for all you do for native plants. But let me see, I think that is pretty much, yeah, that's a native plant database I was talking about. Um, yeah, that is, that is pretty much all I have. So if you guys have any questions for me, let me know. All right, guys, let's, uh, if you have questions, I was, I was scanning through the chat. I think we've probably addressed most of the questions there. Um, Jen, I know you mentioned uh, in the bio and um, that you'd been, uh, you'd done some plantings here in the Midlands area. Um, any, uh, any plans for anything additional or any, any comments about what uh, the, some of the projects you've done around here, like at uh, Lace House for Governor's Mansion? Yeah, the Governor's Mansion and Lace House are the main, main ones that we've worked on in the Columbia area and the Midlands area. And they, thankfully, because we know the grounds crew there and it's the same folks, um, they've done a great job taking care of it. And I think it's doing really well. Um, there are no plans currently. Uh, there was a really big grant program from Audubon to do native plant installations and that money has run out. So there's, I don't have any, unfortunately, future plans in the immediate uh, time to yeah. do any more installations. But um, if there's an opportunity, I'd love to help. <laughs> well, there's a question here asking if you are available for consults in the Charleston area. <laughs> you might be able to- Yeah, shoot me an email. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. I'll put my email in the chat. So if anyone wants to, to chat about anything, we can. Um, there it is. Let's see. Uh, question is the presentation available for download or email? We we are recording, and I'm, I apologize I didn't mention that beforehand, but but this uh, the recording of this will be available if uh, Jen does not object. <laughs> nope. Okay. I always for, forget to hit record. Like I always introduce whatever, <laughs> and then I'm five minutes into it. I'm like, oh no. And I can't tell you how many times that's happened to me, but. Um, yes. <laughs> you're not the only one. Um, oh, here's a, here's a question about the, what's the best way to keep a bird cleaner, a bird feeder clean? Not, a, not exactly a plant question, but a bird question. Yes. So I think when it comes to bird feeding, um, the best thing to do is get high quality seed. So if you get your seed from the grocery store or from Walmart or Lowe's, usually that is the seeds old. It's been sitting in a warehouse. It's full of fillers that the birds don't even eat. Those little brown round seeds It's called a red Milo, I think, and red millet. Um, our birds don't eat it at all. And so when you see bird seeds full of that stuff, they're just chucking it out and kicking it out of the way and making a big mess on the ground. Um, so I prefer quality seed um, from usually Wild Birds Limited or some of those stores. They sell one that's called like No Mess Blend and it has no shells on it. And so it seems like it's more expensive, but you're actually paying less per seed because you're not paying for the weight of the shell. Um, and so if you get that and only fill it up a little bit at a time and make sure the birds are going through it in a, a good amount of time, that's one really good way. And then also if it rains or if it's really humid, again, don't fill it up too much so the birds are going through it faster so it doesn't get moldy and gunky. Um, and then they also have a type of feeder called a quick clean tube feeder. So it's really nice because tube feeders are a pain to clean. Um, you know, half time you have to use a screwdriver and try to get in all the corners and stuff like that. But this quick clean feeder, if you hold it, there's like two little buttons on the bottom and the bottom just pops off. And so it's super easy to clean out um, and make sure it looks really good. And there's even like nicer versions that have, um, I think it's called like A-G-I-O-N, Ageon. I'm not sure how you pronounce that, but it's an antimicrobial agent in the plastic tubing itself, which helps to reduce the mold and mildew and bacteria. So keeping them clean um, is just frequent changing, getting a good seed, getting a good feeder. And then to actually clean it itself, um, I'm sure you guys probably remember the siskin issue last year with salmonella. We had an eruption year of pine siskins and they were coming down in big groups and um, they were getting sick with salmonella. And there's also like a, a house finch eye disease, a conjunctivitis type thing that's very transmittable, um, especially in places like feeders and bird baths. So if you see a sick bird like that, I would leave your feeder empty for a couple of days 
and hope that that bird moves on and then clean your feeder with bleach and water. So that's, that's the best thing to do. There's a bird banding question. I think somebody oh. said out of curiosity, what does bird bagging mean? Bird bagging. Oh, okay. So <laughs> when you bag the birds, um, give me one sec. I'm sure I have one here. Uh, let's see. So I don't have a bird here, but I have a bird bag. Um, <clears throat> when we band birds that we trap them different ways. So some of them is like a feeder trap where you put a bird feeder inside and it's built like a crab trap. So they go in, get on the feeder. And then when you start coming up to the trap, they don't realize how to get out. And so you just go and kind of scoop them up real quick. Or you put them at, put up a big net, a mist net. It's about 30 feet long and about 10 feet high. And it's very, very fine. So the birds just are flying along, minding their own business. And then they fall into the net and it's kind of like a hammock. They just kind of fall into a pocket and then sit there until you come and get them. But when you get them, you put them in um, this little pillowcase type thing. So you just open it up, put the bird in there, you close it around your hand, pull your hand out, and then you pull the string tight. This one has a nut in it. This one must have just gone through the wash. There you go. And then you wrap it and pull it like that. And then you have a bagged bird. <laughs> so bagging the bird is what the this means. And then if they have been feeding in a maritime forest or someplace of pokeweed, you will get purple blotches all over the bottom of the bag because they're processing it very quickly and then pooping out the purple. <laughs> Good okay. question. Here's one that says, you mentioned millet. Uh, do our birds meet, eat white or yellow millet or no millet at all? Good question. So some people don't like to feed millet. If you have painted buntings, that's their favorite. They're the super fancy bird with like, it's like a champagne look, but a beer pocketbook. They love the cheap <laughs> millet seed. <laughs> so if you have painted buntings or indigo buntings, that's great. Um, if you get sparrows in the winter time, chipping sparrows, white throated sparrows, white crown sparrows, those will all come to white millet. Um, I wouldn't get a solely white millet feeder unless you're specifically feeding painted buntings. Um, but a mix with some millet in it is good. I always get a little bit of millet in mine and the doves like it too. Yeah. Um, thoughts on birdhouses? Birdhouses are great as long as you get a good one and you mount it correctly. <laughs> Some birdhouses can almost act like a population sink if you have it in a bad spot or it doesn't have a predator guard on it. So, you know, the chicks get eaten by snakes repeatedly. Or if you have a cat in your yard or a neighbor's cat and you put up a birdhouse and then the cat just takes out the parents and the chicks as they come out. So think about your conditions and then put up the right house in the right place. Yeah. Okay. Well, folks, it looks like we're, um, we're coming up on eight o'clock. I want to be respectful of our presenter's time and also um, of her, um, her adorable girl's uh, need for her attention. So if you have it's any, just about bedtime. <laughs> if you have any additional questions, I think Jen has provided her uh, email in the, in the chat. So um, I hope I'm, you won't be inundated, but um, I think, I think Jen would be, uh, would be happy to answer uh, specific questions that you might have. Absolutely. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Jen. I, this is, uh, this was a real treat for me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I could be uh, president of your fan club. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It was great talking to you guys. Yeah, I love thanks. talking to groups like this who just appreciate and get all the information I'm, uh, you know, preaching to you guys. So thank you for all that you guys do. Okay. Thanks so much. If you need to go, we'll, we'll, we'll say goodbye. We're going to probably, I'm going to ask our president if he has anything for the group, but um but um, you're awesome. welcome to stay if you like. If not, thank you again so much. Um, I'll be in touch. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I'm probably going to sign off. It's uh, toothbrushing and pajama time. So I, I understand. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks again. All right, President Bill. Anything for the good of the order? Yeah, two things that I need to bring up. One is I need to thank. Uh, our plant sale committee one more time for their great job. Um, They're here. Everyone did really well. Uh, Lynn uh, for helping publicize it uh, with Trish, one of our committee members, they worked together. I uh, got to thank uh, Historic Columbia